You're listening to the Digital Barbell Podcast. Our mission is to provide you with a clear path to health and fitness through education, coaching, and accountability. We are your hosts, Jonathan and Blakely Fletcher, and we are here to serve you. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a five-star review so that we can reach more people. You can find us daily on Instagram and Facebook at Digital Barbell. Now, let's get to today's topic. All right, guys, welcome to episode number 84 of the Digital Barbell Podcast. Thank you for being here. Thanks for tuning in every week. We've got a nutrition-related episode for you today. So if you like to geek out on things like calories and metabolism and energy balance and macronutrients and your total daily energy expenditure, you're in luck. This is going to be a two-part episode, so there's a heads up on what's to come in this episode. You ready for this week's win of the week? I am. All right, so this is a really good one. Our um, our client, John H., I'll just call him okay. John H. I don't think he needs to be kept secret, but anyway, I'll okay. just say John H. He's a custom training and nutrition client, and he posted this in our free digital barbell community Facebook group. If anybody's listening to this, anybody's welcome to join. There's, I'll put a link to how to join in the show notes. It's just a group of our clients and even non-clients who just share helpful tips and try to support Mm -hmm. each other. So if you're hearing this, you're welcome to join. So, um, John is, he's a veteran and he just, he said, I just found out my lab results from the VA online and got some great news. So John's down about 45 pounds since we've been working together, and the last time he had his blood checked was in 2008, and there was a lot of things that were out of line as far as his cholesterol, triglycerides, his um, insulin sensitivity, and uh, he was bordering on pre-diabetic at the time. So here we go. So his cholesterol from then to now is down from 207 to 180, so big gains there. Mm -hmm. Triglycerides are down from 129 to 72. His HDL is from 43 to 45. His LDL is down to 120 from 150. And his A1C measurement is down five point, from 5.8 to 5.2. So he is out of the pre-diabetic range. Oh, so wow. all That's the hard work really that he's been putting in is paying off. Definitely. Yeah, and I think it helps that um, you know his wife also works with us so yeah. you know despite the challenges that they both face like they're in this together and yeah. i think that's an underestimated life hack mm-hmm. is to try to get your partner your wife your spouse whatever yeah on board and i just love um seeing their videos and it's proof that they do they are in this together because you know we ask for people to do like video check-in so we can see their form and they they video each other and i just think it's it's just a, it's adorable and it's, yeah. it just shows that they're both in it together and both supporting each other i often hear her in the background of his videos counting off yeah, his reps and, and encouraging <laughs> him to get more I, know, I love it <laughs> yeah so keep it up john i'm excited to uh, to see how far you can take this yes so uh without further ado let's get into today's topic every once in a while it's good to go really deep into a topic to really understand what's going on and today is one of those days this will be a practical discussion about calories metabolism and fat loss By the end, you'll have a great understanding of what calories really are, why you need them, how to know how many you need, and why it's important to take losing or gaining weight seriously, and how to do it right. Since we'll be getting into a lot of science and fancy terminology and the specifics of how they apply to you, we're going to break this up into two episodes, so be sure and subscribe if you haven't already so you'll know when part two is released. Metabolism, calories, and energy balance are fairly complicated topics with a lot of moving parts, intertwined pieces, and a decent amount of science. Unless you're into it, there's really no reason why you'd need to know the nitty-gritty ins and outs. When you see TV segments on health and fitness on morning TV or in headlines on magazines, they certainly can't spend the time they'd need to thoroughly explain things. Most of the time when I see these segments on TV, I'm not really all that convinced that the special guest even knows the things you're about to learn in these two episodes. Speaking of what you're going to learn, let's lay that out before we begin. We're going to talk about what calories are and how they're measured, the caloric content of the three macronutrients, why we eat and how we turn that food into energy, how our body uses the calories we eat, which is called our TDEE, how to determine your TDEE, 
What happens when you eat more calories than you need? What happens when you eat less calories than you need? And how your body adapts to increases and decrease in calories. This is called metabolic adaptation. And last but not least, how to use all of this knowledge to your advantage. So buckle up, buttercup, and let's go. Let's start with what calories are and how they're measured. You can't talk about food, metabolism, and nutrition without getting into calories. Some people think calories don't matter at all, and some people think they're all that matters. Here's a little spoiler alert. They matter, but they're not all that matters. No matter where you fall on the spectrum of calorie belief, let's define what they are. If you had a microscope and you could zoom in really close on a cookie, you'd see these little calorie soldiers walking around just waiting to get into your belly and make you fat. I'm kidding. A calorie is just a unit of measurement, energy in this case, and it's a way to assign a value just like a gallon or a mile or a teaspoon. More specifically, a calorie with a small c is the amount of energy it takes to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. So when we reference this in terms of nutrition, one calorie with a capital C contains 1,000 of these lowercase calories with the small c. That's why nutritional calories are sometimes referred to as kilo calories or kcals, because kilo means a thousand. So how do we know how many of these units of energy are in the foods that we eat? Well, luckily the FDA makes food companies report this information to us on the food packaging because of the Nutrition and Food Labeling Act of 1990. But maybe you're wondering how the food companies and the scientists come to learn how many calories are actually in those foods. Well, wonder no more. This part might sound like a joke, but it's true. Nutrition scientists use a tool called a bomb calorimeter, yes, that's a real thing, to measure the caloric content of foods. Within the calorimeter are two chambers, one inside of the other. Food is weighed and then placed in the inner chamber along with oxygen, which is combustible, and then it's sealed up. The outer chamber is then filled with water. The oxygen is ignited and the food in the inner chamber burns. As the food burns, the scientists monitor the rise in the water temperature in the outer chamber. If the water temperature rises one degree per kilogram of food weight, that equals one calorie in the food. A two degree rise per kilo equals two calories, and so on. So foods that are higher in calories will raise the water temperature in the outer chamber as they burn more than lower calorie foods. How freaking cool is that? So now that we know what a calorie is and how the caloric content of food is measured, let's keep going. I'm sure in reading food labels and just from plain old common sense, you've noticed that certain foods are much higher than others in calories. The reason that's the case is because different foods contain different amounts of the three macronutrients, protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And each of those macronutrients has different amounts of calories per gram of weight. So luckily for food manufacturers, researchers, and the USDA have written tables based on measuring thousands of individual ingredients, breaking down their macronutrient, and thus their calorie content. This keeps companies from having to use a bomb calorimeter for each food that they make. The current widely accepted caloric content of the three macronutrients are 4 calories per gram of protein, 4 calories per gram of carbohydrates, and 9 calories per gram of fat. So obviously two foods that weigh the same might have totally different amounts of calories depending on what and how much of each macronutrient are in the food. So in case you've forgotten, protein comes mainly from animal products. Carbohydrates come mainly from sugars, fruits, vegetables, grains, legumes, and fats are mainly contained in oils, non-lean meats, nuts, and seeds, and dairy. Let's look at a real life example using a can of black beans. I say look, but this is a podcast, so use your imagination and keep your eyes on the road. The label on a can of black beans says that a serving weighs 125 grams. So according to the label, that 125 grams contains 7 grams of protein, 20 grams of carbs, and no fat. So since we know that both protein and carbs each have 4 calories per gram, we can add it up, 20 plus 7, and multiply that times four to find out how many calories are in the serving, so 108 calories. Now, if you've ever tracked your food in an app like MyFitnessPal, you've probably noticed that this calculation doesn't always exactly match the label. The reason that happens is because labels aren't required to use decimal points, which causes some rounding discrepancies from time to time. But don't get too hung up on that. Your health definitely does not swing in the balance of two or three calories per food. 
Okay, let's keep moving. Let's talk about why we eat and how we turn food into energy. So other than the fact that food is delicious, why do we need to eat it? Well, quite simply because it contains those energy-containing macronutrients that we just finished learning about. Just like a 747 runs on jet fuel, our bodies run on calories. Every process within our body, from digestion to doing a burpee, gets its energy from calories. It's pretty wild that we get to choose from an endless list of foods to give ourselves energy, right? But even with all that variety, all our body really cares about at the end of the day is that it gets energy from somewhere. But since you can't drop by a Five Guys and order a calorie burger with fries, our bodies have to take the food that we eat and convert the macronutrients in them into energy that our body does know how to use. We call this whole umbrella of food to energy conversion our metabolism. If you're zoning out, <laughs> come back. We're about to get into some science. So there are four main methods our body uses to convert food to energy. The final product of all these conversions is called ATP. It stands for adenosine triphosphate. ATP is required for all cellular functions and has many, many roles in the body. But for our purposes today, we're going to focus on the big one. ATP is used to power all of the mechanical functions of our bodies, you know, moving around and doing stuff. But before we get into all that, let's back up and look at those conversion processes just for a second. When we eat, our bodies immediately start digesting our food, even when it's still in our mouths. Through cellular respiration, the sugars that naturally occur in foods are converted into ATP. It's a much more complicated process than that involving oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. But it's important to know that these sugars known as glucose play a vital role in this process. Foods that have carbohydrates are our main source of glucose. As ATP is generated, it's stored in our muscles to be used for energy demands. But we don't store a whole lot of ATP, so our bodies are always synthesizing new ATP to keep us fueled, so long as we're still eating food. Okay, so let's regroup. We've learned what a calorie is and how they're measured. We've talked about how food contains different amounts of each of the three macronutrients and how that affects how many calories are in the food we eat. And we talked about the fact that our body needs to convert food into energy and how that's done. Let's get into how our body uses the calories that we eat. Remember when we talked at the very beginning of this episode about how our bodies need calories to perform all of the many functions that we ask of them? Well, let's dig into that and get specific. One fascinating thing about nutrition is how much variability there is from person to person. There's no way to say that every person's nutrition should look the same because we're all so different. We have different jobs. We have different habits. We have different activity levels. We have different weights and heights. We have different genetics. We have different experience with diets that have affected the way our bodies even use energy. All of this adds up to the fact that we all have different amounts of energy that our bodies need to exist at our current size and activity level. We have a name for this concept. It's called our Total Daily Energy Expenditure, or our TDEE for short. This is the total energy, measured in calories, that you need to maintain your current body size at your current activity level. Remember how we talked earlier about how our bodies use energy for all the different things we do, from sleeping to digesting to running a marathon? Well, all of those activities, whether they're voluntary or involuntary, they all use calories. When you add up all of the calories each day that are burned to do those things, that equals our TDEE. So if food is calories in to our body, then our TDEE is calories out of our body. This relationship between in and out is called energy balance. We'll definitely talk about that more later. All of those calories burned in our TDEE on the calories outside of energy balance can be broken up into four basic categories. First, our basal metabolic rate, otherwise known as our BMR. Secondly, non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT. Third, exercise activity. Fourth, the thermic effect of food, or TEF. Let's talk about the big boy first, our BMR. I call it the big boy because it devours about 60% of our daily energy. Think of your BMR as all the things your body has to do just to keep you alive, even if you just laid in bed all day. It is the bare minimum number of calories you're going to burn every day, even doing nothing. Some of the major parts of your BMR include things like breathing, circulating blood, regulating your body temperature, 
growing your cells and your brain and nerve function. Like I said, the majority of all your calories are burned by your BMR. That's important to remember, so file that away in your brain for later. Let's move on to the next biggest part of your TDEE, your non-exercise activity thermogenesis, or NEAT as it's called. This accounts for about 15% of your TDEE. These non-exercise calories are burned doing things like blinking, fidgeting, using your phone and your computer, and other non-exercise movements like just standing or walking from task to task. The number one thing I want you to remember about your NEAT is that it is highly adaptable. What I mean is that since so much of NEAT is involuntary, your body will auto-regulate how much NEAT you do based on how much energy you're putting into your body. We'll go into this more later when we talk about what happens when you eat more or less than your body needs, but do remember, your NEAT is not set in stone. All right, let's move on to what is undoubtedly the most overestimated category when it comes to calorie burn, exercise activity. This one's highly variable from person to person because, well, some people exercise a lot and some people are more into sleeping in and chilling on the couch with the Kardashians. But even if you are the exercising type, it's really easy to overestimate how many calories you're burning through exercise. This is especially true if you're counting on the reading from an activity tracker like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or a Garmin or a Whoop Band. Unfortunately, these devices are notoriously inaccurate despite recent improvements. Exercising is generally not a reason to eat more because of the calories burned doing it. Let me explain why. If you're snoozing, wake up. Picture a 150 pound person. On a one hour brisk walk, they'll burn about 260 calories. On a 30 minute jog, they'll burn a few more, about 280 calories. If they do 30 minutes of aerobics, we're down to 225 calories. In over 30 minutes of circuit training, they'll burn about 280 calories. Listen, we aren't telling you that exercising is a bad idea or that you shouldn't be doing it multiple times per week. You should be, but you should be doing so with the intent to improve your health, your fitness, your strength, confidence, and longevity, not to count how many calories you're burning or worse yet, try to burn off something that you ate. The truth is, you'd be hard-pressed to even find a protein bar that has less than 200 calories, and that's considered a healthy snack. You know those delicious Girl Scout cookies, the ones we eat, you know, for charity? Just four measly Thin Mints have 160 calories. Has anybody actually only ever eaten four of those little things? It would take me exactly 67 seconds to eat like eight of those little devils. That would mean I'd have to walk for well over an hour to burn those calories off. Can you see why you cannot out-exercise a high-calorie diet? There simply aren't enough hours in the day when you start talking about foods like pizza and chicken wings. For the average person, exercise activity accounts for only about 15% of their TDEE every day. Okay, let's talk about the last and the most often unknown about element of TDEE, the thermic effect of food, or TEF. I know before becoming a nutrition coach and dedicating time to learning about the science of nutrition, I had no clue about this one. TEF is the energy used by your body while extracting the energy from your food. That sounds like some kind of inception stuff right there, right? Well, think about it like this. Your car runs on gas to make power. The goal is to make the wheels turn, but there's a lot of wasted energy in the many, many processes between the gas tank and the tires. In the same way, Your body producing energy, or ATP, uses calories during that process. The interesting thing to know is that the three macronutrients don't have the same cost to digest and obtain energy from. For our purposes here, you should know that protein and fiber cost the most when it comes to extracting their nutrients. What that means to us in practice is that we'll burn more calories eating protein and fiber than we will carbohydrates that aren't fiber and fat. Overall, TEF makes up about 10 to 15% of our TDEE. So even though the impact of TEF is not huge in the grand scheme of our TDEE, paying attention to our protein and our fiber intake can often move the needle in situations where we've hit a weight loss plateau. Speaking of hitting a plateau, we're going to table this discussion for now. Next week, we'll pick back up by telling you exactly how to determine your TDEE and how to use that knowledge to lose fat or build muscle. Come to think of it, if you cannot wait until next week and you want a partner to do this with you, you can apply for coaching in the description of this episode. 
So until then, have a great day, friends. Thank you all for listening. We truly appreciate it. But real quick, before we go, do us a favor and subscribe to the podcast and leave us a review. Be sure and follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Digital Barbell for all of the latest and greatest free content. If you're interested in working with Blakely and I, we'd love to talk. Apply for coaching with the link in the description of this episode or by visiting digitalbarbell.com. We'd love to talk about helping you reach your goals with a training and nutrition program built just for you. Thanks again and have a great day.